Okay, Rodimus, it's time to pass the Matrix back to Optimus. What do you mean you don't want to? Isn't giving up the Matrix your shtick? The one time we want you to do it, you chicken out. <sighs> Look, I know it feels a little weird, but I had already started working on the Rodimus Prime review before I got the Hot Rod toy, and I need a way to justify the order of these videos. So just hand over the Matrix so you can revert back to your younger self. There. Was that so hard? Okay, now that he's finally given the Matrix back, we can take a look at the companion piece to Kingdom Rodimus Prime, Studio Series 8604 Hot Rod. While Rodimus Prime has had precious little toy representation since G1, Hot Rod has gotten a lot of toys over the years. I should know, I own most of them. So it's easy to ask what the point of getting a new Hot Rod toy is when you already have one already. Well, let's see what this figure has to offer and see if it's enough to warrant buying him. Once again, we're looking at a new take on G1 Hot Rod's original car mode, the sort of Dome Zero Corvette hybrid we've come to know and love over the years. But this time, he's aiming for full-blown animation accuracy with minimal creative liberty. And I have to admit, they pretty much nailed it. It's not quite as exaggerated as the animation model was, but he does have the airfoil-shaped central body, the sort of coke bottle-esque profile of the side sections, and the triple exhausts that go from just behind the cockpit all the way to the rear of the car. The only major inaccuracy I see is that the rear afterburners are missing. Instead, the wrist cuffs they're supposed to be formed from are visible on either side of the cockpit. But given the level of cheating that the animation model does to make that transformation element happen, I think it's fair to afford the toy this one concession. The real blow to screen accuracy is with the colors. At least in the movie, which this toy purports to be based on, Hot Rod was consistently depicted as a bright magenta color. The toy, meanwhile, is more of a pale maroon. Now, I don't mind this that much. Not only do I just kinda prefer my Hot Rods on the redder end of the spectrum, but the color difference here is more subtle than it is with a lot of Hasbro's other modern hot rods. But I won't deny that for a Studio Series figure, it does kind of suck that they abandoned screen accuracy for what I can only assume was to make him more marketable to younger boys. That aside, the figure does pretty well deco-wise. For the most part, the plastic colors speak for themselves, but there is paint where it's needed. The exhaust pipes and engine block are painted in silver to give them a proper shine, the headlights and hood are done in orange, and there's just enough maroon paint around the canopy to give it the proper detail. And of course, there is a tampograph on the hood for the flame deco. I think the only paint app that's missing is the orange on the spoiler. I don't know if the spoiler happens to be made of an unpaintable plastic, given that every other yellow part seems to be a small structural piece, but if it is, that would be understandable. If not... It's a bit of an eyesore, but not a deal-breaker. The functionality in this mode is about what you'd expect. Rolling and accessory integration. There are slots on both the engine block and the roof where you can attach the two guns he comes with, and the buzzsaw can attach on top of them. At least, it can when you put them on the roof. I don't know if this is an issue of tolerances or if it's just not designed to work, but the tabs just will not line up when attached to the engine. Also, the tabs on the gun are too thick due to the added paint, so the fit is super tight. Especially on the buzzsaw, which on pretty much every copy I've heard of has developed stress marks the first time it was attached to the guns. There's also a pair of effect parts that you can attach to the end of the exhaust pipes. They're even shaped specifically to fit with the staggered arrangement of the pipes. They don't look much like exhausts, but then again, this is supposed to be a future car. Maybe this is just what car exhausts look like on Earth in 2005 of the Primax 9A 4.17 Alpha timeline. So as far as the vehicle mode goes, Hot Rod seems to be nailing it. There's very little for me to find fault with. He looks like the cartoon and can do quite a bit. If he had just a slightly better deco and the guns were slightly better designed, I would call this perfect. 
Hot Rod famously never transformed the same way twice in the movie, so the designers had pretty much carte blanche to do whatever they wanted with this toy. And appropriately enough, they seem to have built the transformation for both Hot Rod and Rodimus Prime from the same basic structure. I like to start by opening the hood and folding the headlight pieces in. This untabs the shoulders, freeing up the arms to rotate out of the way. Be careful when separating the pipes. The tabs holding them together are really small and really tight, so they break easily if you try to force them. And unlike on the Kingdom toys I reviewed, the vehicle mode does suffer from losing these tabs, since there is a noticeable gap without them. So far, I've managed to preserve one of the tabs by gently pushing the arm in to unhook it, so that would probably be my advice. From here, the legs untab from the rear section, and the spoiler section folds up and out of the way. You want to keep the legs spread out from here, since the bulk of the leg hinges inward for the leg to unfold. I wish the pieces tabbed in more securely when folding them back up. The left leg on mine does not want to hold together for some reason. Mileage may vary, though. But now we get to the devious part of the conversion process. He has a faux chest. The hood assembly spins around to orient the arms, then the whole thing collapses into the cockpit behind a static chest piece. It gives him a nicer looking chest than just using the real car hood would have, but it is kind of a cheat. From here, we're down to simple touch-ups. Flip the spoiler up and around to go on his back, fold up the panels on his arms, and turn the head around, and that's the transformation complete. It's a really fun process, though it is a little debatable whether it quite lives up to the Voyager price point. I'm gonna say it. This is the best looking hot rod toy to ever come out of Hasbro or Takara. Even with the liberties taken for the sake of integrating him with the Generations line, putting him next to the animation model, he's just about a dead ringer. I think the faux chest helps a lot with that. Because it doesn't have to worry about looking good as a car hood, the chest is free to be as cut and chiseled as it needs to be to be accurate. The faux bumper even extends deep into the torso, just like the cartoon. Once again, the biggest detriment to accuracy is the color scheme. Pretty much all the paint apps are where they should be, but not only is the red still off, but the color of the legs is a little off. What should be a flat gray or even black color is replaced with this sort of dull purple. Granted, some shots from the movie do make his shins look more like this color, but that seems to be more a matter of lighting. When you actually look at his original model sheets, they're clearly meant to just be dark gray. This is something they do a lot with screen accurate color schemes, and while I'm not necessarily opposed to it, it does tend to confuse me a bit. Back to judging the toy on its own merits, one thing I will commend this figure for is being clean. Looking at him from the back, there is virtually no kibble. Most of the vehicle bulk is used to make up the body of the robot, and the bits that aren't tuck up into the torso and legs. Even the rear section of the car, which supports the back wing, it's basically been reduced to a thin strut. And while the hood assembly does just tuck away inside the torso, that's pretty much where it would have gone anyway had it been properly integrated. So the only parts I would really consider a waste are the rear fenders. Oh, and speaking of those rear fenders, you can actually leave them flipped out if you want to make him look more like the G1 toy. The panels still tab shut and everything, so it makes no difference to the articulation or to the aesthetics beyond bulking out the sides of the legs. This seems to just be an accident of the transformation, but Hasbro actually utilized this in the stock photography for the tragically cancelled toy-based Velocitron redeco. So maybe there was some thought that went into this, but I guess we'll never know. What I do know is that a lot of thought went into the articulation. The neck is on a ball joint with plenty of range in all directions. His shoulders are articulated just like Rodimus Prime, with a forward swivel, an outward hinge inside the torso, and a butterfly joint. Unfortunately, the butterfly joint only has clearance when the arm is hinged out, so while there's a lot of joints going on here, it's actually somewhat limited. I really wish they'd found a way to give him a proper outward shoulder, one that rotates with the arm. He has a bicep swivel and a nice bend at the elbow, almost 135 degrees. The wrists can swivel, and the fingers open and close. The waist rotates without any obstruction, always nice to see. He has those integrated pelvis hips we've been seeing a lot of lately, so he can move his legs freely while still looking relatively clean, 
though they can't go too far backward. He has very stiff thigh swivels and a double joint in the knee. Lastly, the feet can pivot both forward and back and inwards. So already, despite his small size, he is living up to his Voyager price point. And this trend continues when we get into the boatload of features this guy has. First of all, the helmet opens up, revealing a flip-out visor, so you can recreate that scene from the movie where Hot Rod spots the Decepticons on the Autobot shuttle, giving him the opportunity to shoot them down, preventing the total destruction of Autobot City. But do you think he gets credit for that? <sighs> Sorry, had to vent. It's a nice feature, but folding it back in feels a little awkward. If you fold it back all the way, it'll interfere with the helmet hinge. But if you leave it up just a little bit, the helmet kind of forces it back down all the way. It's a little uncomfortable, especially with it being a clear plastic part. Going down to the arms, there's a panel on the underside of either forearm that opens up, allowing you to flip the hands around. On the right arm, you get the welding torch he used to repair a cup on Quintessa, and on the left arm, you get a 5mm peg. This allows you to attach his buzzsaw accessory, so you can recreate the ocean fight scene on, once again, Quintessa. The blade doesn't spin as freely as I'd like, but it looks really nice on him. It's well proportioned, and the silver on the blade is still very nice. It amuses me that they molded speed lines into the sides, kind of a nod to how in the movie it's depicted as just two blades that only look like a circle because they're spinning so fast. Speaking of accessories, we still have a few to talk about. Of course, you get his twin photon lasers. There is a strong resemblance to the original toy's guns, but they've been slightly redesigned to make them more symmetrical. This does make them look nicer together when mounted in vehicle mode, but I do wish they were a bit more visually distinct, like the G1 toy. Before I put all four guns together side by side, I had a hard time noticing the differences between the Studio Series guns. He can hold them in his hands, of course, and they look pretty good. But if you'd prefer to tuck them away, the roof slots from vehicle mode are still accessible, so you can store them on his back about as effectively as you could in vehicle mode. You can also still put the buzzsaw on top, but it has a lot of the same problems. The effect parts from vehicle mode are also still usable in this mode, and I find they make more sense this way. While they didn't really look right as car exhaust, they look really good as energy blasts. I kind of wish they were done in orange to better match the effect from the movie, but the crackling energy appearance does look interesting, while still hearkening to some shots from the movie. But the cherry on top of all that is, of course, the Matrix of Leadership. It's strikingly similar to the one that came with Rodimus, but it's actually a slightly different mold. The handles look pretty much identical, but the detailing on the core is subtly altered. I am absolutely indifferent to these changes, though I will say I prefer the shade of gold used on Hot Rods compared to Rodimus Primes. Other molding changes include the hole on the back now being much bigger. In fact, it is now bigger than a 5mm port, so it is still entirely useless. And the last molding difference I was able to find is that it does not fit in Rodimus Prime's chest. It doesn't even work with the glow effect that came with that toy. It's kind of weird, the matrices are so similar in both size and appearance that you'd think Hasbro would just reuse the same mold with no alterations from figure to figure. But instead, they made an entirely new mold where the only meaningful difference is making them not cross-compatible. But how does it work with the set it came in? Well, by virtue of his articulated fingers, Hot Rod can hold the Matrix, and while the arm articulation is a little limited, you can get most of the classic Matrix poses out of him. And with his smaller hands, it actually looks more in proportion here than it did with Rodimus. While it doesn't work with Rodimus' Matrix effect, you do get a different effect part that does fit this one. It has a bit more of a crackling energy look here, rather than the straight rays of light that came with Rodimus. This makes it more evocative of the Matrix being opened to destroy Unicron, rather than it simply glowing as it reformatted Hot Rod into Rodimus. Which makes me wonder why they didn't use this effect for Rodimus' Matrix and the simple glow effect for Hot Rod. But I guess this gives you some options if you have two figures to swap parts around with. Just try to remember whose is whose. And that's all this Matrix does. Hot Rod's chest doesn't open up to reveal a Matrix chamber. There is a cavity in his midsection big enough for it to rattle around in, but I guess that making an actual chamber would have been too much engineering even for this toy. I'm glad they included the Matrix, don't get me wrong, but it does feel like a bit of an afterthought. 
Also, for all you Regeneration 1 fans, he can technically hold the Sword of Primus that came with Rodimus Prime. But getting it into his hand is more difficult here, since his thumb and fingers curl in more tightly than they did on Rodimus. Every time I try to do this, I feel like I'm gonna break something, so I try not to do it that often. Hot Rod's included backdrop depicts the depths of Unicron. Specifically, it's meant to recreate that famous Matrix opening shot from the movie, which is probably the only scene they could have possibly used here. And I really can't fault the artwork here. It recreates the background in that scene almost flawlessly, while also adding a bunch of extra detail. We mainly see this in the far background, where we can see a bunch more spires that were in complete shadow in the actual movie. And just like the toy, there's a bunch of additional panel lines drawn in that weren't shown in the movie. I really love the aesthetic of this. It gives me the impression that this is what the animators were trying to convey, without the limitations of a $5 million animated movie. Since the toy is so small for its size class, he fits quite comfortably on the base. Normally I'd be thrilled by this, and while it is nice, the scene this is trying to recreate isn't exactly a dynamic action scene. Pretty much everybody's just going to pose him standing with the Matrix in his hands, so that extra space isn't going to see much use. At least, not with this toy. If we bring in Rodimus Prime, now that extra space feels warranted. While this is almost certainly a happy accident, the fact that this stand can fit both figures is the most perfect thing I can imagine. I held off on getting this toy for a long time because I was pretty well satisfied with my Titan's Return Hot Rod. But as my War for Cybertron collection grew, that figure's age started showing more and more. And now that I've finally caved, I 100% do not regret this purchase. This is, in my opinion, the best G1 Hot Rod toy they've ever made. I would even argue it's better than the Masterpiece. 35 bucks may seem like much for a figure this size, but you get a lot more for that money than you would out of a normal deluxe. If you've been collecting Modern Generations toys and have any interest in Hot Rod as a character, I would consider this a must-have. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to figure out what I'm going to do with all these Hot Rods. You can fly if you try leaving the past behind Heaven only knows what you might find You can win if you dare.